Well, good evening, brothers and sisters. Uh, glad you could join us for this uh, Zoom meeting tonight. Uh, just to explain, I'll be very, very brief because we, we want to get into the message from our, our brother Keith in a moment, and I'll introduce him in a moment too. But th this is the first of, um, well, what's planned, God willing, uh, three C a talks on deception in the church. Um, and Keith is going to speak tonight and on the, the most fundamental doctrine uh, in, the, in the gospel. So uh, I'm going to hand you over to Keith, but just to say, Keith um, and the others on, this, on the platform tonight, who are part of a, a team that's been working together since uh, late summer in 2020 to try and uh, understand uh, all that's going on in our world, politics, medicine, spirituality, try and tie it all together. And we, we hosted a, a conference in March 2021. Keith was one of the main three main speakers. Keith from a city church in Limerick where he pastors. When he's not there, he's traveling abroad and ministering uh, in different places. So we're delighted to have Keith uh, speak to us tonight. So he, as I say, he's from Limerick in, in the south of Ireland. Uh, but born in the north, he, very sadly, Keith lost his dear wife towards the end of last year. So our hearts go out to him, but we, we pray that through our brother, uh, we will hear from the Lord tonight. So I'm just going to uh, hand over to Keith now. Uh, Keith, over to you, brother. Praise God. Thank you, brother uh, Colin. Uh, it's so good to be with you here tonight. And it is important what we're dealing with. Um, both tonight and I believe in another two parts, we're going to be dealing with deception in the church and outside of the church. And there's nothing more important than this vital issue of deception. Jesus warned us that the last days, one of the great marks of it would be deception in the church. And that's where we're beginning tonight. It's not just the deception that comes from the world, other religions or the new age, but we're starting tonight right inside the church, right within the pulpit. And that's one of the most dangerous places where deception comes from. And that's where we're going to begin to deal with and look at how Jesus warned about deception. Now, I'm going to use glasses. I've never used glasses in preaching before. Uh, There's going to be a new experience for me, but I'm looking at the screen and <clears throat> I can't see much of anything. So, I've, I've tried to fight against age. I'm in a bit of self-denial. Everything I'll preach to you tonight is true, and it's the Word of God. But my human element, I am living in a, 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 in a bit of unreality as far as my eyesight. I'm fighting up, but I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to wear my glasses for the first time and preach to you. You know, it's a bit like the Word of God. You know, people try to see things in the church and the body of Christ, and yet they don't have their glasses on. I am fully persuaded that most Christians do not look at the things of this hour in the light of God's word. But here tonight, we're going to go to God's word, and I'm going to ask you to turn to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 18. And our message tonight, I've called it enemies of the cross, a defense of penal substitution. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. But I assure you tonight, we're dealing with enemies of the cross. Reading from Philippians chapter 3 and verse 18. And it says there, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul the Apostle here speaks about those 
in his generation, within the church, not outside the church, and he calls them enemies of the cross of Christ. He actually depicts certain men inside the church. And if you read this chapter, you'll see at the beginning of the chapter, he calls them dogs. He's speaking about men who know the word of God, preach the word of God, and they're caught up in ministry. And Paul says here, I have warned you often about these enemies of the cross. He says not just a few times, but many times. And you find in Paul's letters, Time and time and time again, he warns about enemies within the church, not from without, not within the Roman Empire, not within the Roman army or politics or secular society. But he said there's those right inside what is called the church. And Paul calls them enemies of the cross. And he actually says in this verse, he says, I have to tell you this, weeping. Paul's heart was utterly broken that there were men and women inside the church who were enemies of the cross. What does it mean to be an enemy? It means you attack. You are on the attack. You actually consider the cross or this true message of the cross as something despicable, something to be attacked, something to be mocked. It's a target for your words, for your snide remarks, for your preaching, and you actually attack the cross. Can you imagine anyone inside the church attacking the cross? What Jesus done on the cross in Dan for sinners. Can you imagine that? And yet 2,000 years ago, in the days of the apostles, he says there's men inside the church, in the pulpits, with a Bible in their hand, and they are enemies of the cross. They're using that position to attack the cross of Jesus Christ. Of course, they wouldn't say that. But Paul is saying the message I preach of the cross, they attack it. Let me give you another scripture, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. And this is Peter speaking. But there were false prophets also among the people, speaking about in the Old Testament, in Israel, there were false prophets. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. He's talking about inside the church, not outside the church. There's going to be false prophets, false teachers among you inside the church. And then he tells you what they're going to do. Who privily, and that word privily means to do it secretly, cunningly, craftily, without being noticed. He says they are privily going to bring in damnable heresies. The word actually means to slip in sideways, covertly very secretly, and you sneak right in and you sit down by the side of other believers, Christians in the church. So he said these false preachers and teachers will literally slide right in unnoticed, and they'll be sitting there for a whole period of time before you ever notice them. Then he says in that position in the church, they are going to bring in they don't start with this. They don't preach it as they come in. They're actually inside and they bring in gradually, slowly, progressively from a position of secrecy. They bring in damnable heresies. That means heresies that would damn you. If you believe these teachings that they teach inside the church, it can damn you. It can damage your eternal condition. And I believe that Paul is saying the same when he talks about enemies of the cross. They attack the true message of the cross inside the church. It is damnable heresies. There are certain teachings in the church. You see, the cross is the most important teaching in the entire Bible. Nothing is more important than this. If you change it, if you add to it, if you take away from it, you are endangering your eternal soul. And so Peter says here, they'll come in secretly, bringing in damnable heresies. And then he gives you an example to the extent they go to, even denying the Lord that bought them, talking about Jesus. He says that's how far their damnable teachings will go. In their teaching that they put inside the church, they're going to begin to deny Jesus who bought us. Listen, the word bought means to purchase, to redeem, or to buy. So they're going to begin attacking the message of the one who bought them, who paid a price for them, who 
done something on the cross to redeem them. They'll begin to go as far as denying this teaching. The word denying that he uses there, they're going to begin to deny the Lord that bought them. The word deny means to contradict, to disavow, to reject, to refuse. This Greek word is used 33 times in the New Testament. It means to hold up your hands and to say, no, I'm not accepting this. It's a remarkable Greek word. It means to make a firm refusal against something and not to accept its demands. Do you know what Peter is saying here? There's going to be people inside the church, false teachers, who point to the cross, to Jesus, the Redeemer on the cross, who paid a price, who actually redeemed us, who laid down his life. And these teachers of Jesus, these teachers about the Bible, of the cross, are going to begin to contradict the fact that Jesus paid a price for them on the cross. Can you imagine? But Paul said this, Peter said this, if they had not said that men would get inside the church and begin to preach against the church or against the cross or change the message of the cross, you couldn't believe it. Let me give you another scripture, Jude chapter 1 and verse 3. And it says, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, when Jude began to write, you know what? All he wanted to talk about was our common salvation, about the blood, about salvation, about being born again, how glorious it is. But listen to what he says. When I began like that, it was needful or necessary for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Why did he start wanting to talk about salvation, but then he had to call you to war, to be a fighter? Why is it that we can't just talk about salvation and our Christian life? Why is it we have to be fighting and, and we as preachers have to call the church to stand in the fight? Why is it? Well, he gives the reason in verse four, for there are certain men crept in unawares, the very same thing. They've crept in sideways. They've come in secretly. Jude says the same. They crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ into lasciviousness. In other words, they take the message of grace, turn it upside down and make the message of grace an allowance to live a sinful life. They change the message of grace. They turn it upside down. And it says, and denying, using the same word deny, to contradict, to stand against, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jude says the same. Certain men, they come in sideways and they start changing the message and they begin to deny the Lord. Can you imagine that these three great men of God actually warned in the first century that it was happening in their day, and it will happen in our day, and is happening in our day, that certain men in the church who claim to be born again, Christians, preachers of Christ, believers in the cross of Christ, preachers who say they stand for the cross, and yet they are going to be contradicting the real message of the cross. My message tonight is enemies of the cross, and I'm going to deal with a certain subject, penal substitution, because there's certain men in the church who deny this truth. What is penal substitution? It sounds very technical, but it's not. I'm going to explain it thoroughly tonight. What does it simply mean? It means that on the cross, Jesus Christ died in your place. He took the penalty for your sin that you could go free, and he suffered in your place. He paid the price took the responsibility of your sin, that you could go free and be forgiven. And you know what? This message, what I've just told you, is what most born-again believers actually believe and always have believed. And yet there's some in the church who say, we are against penal substitution, penal penalty, that on the cross, Jesus was our substitute, taken our place and paid a penalty. Let me go for the main man who has attacked this truth and is attacking this truth in our generation. And I'm going to go through and explain this teaching by just addressing his heresies 
his damnable heresies, that if you believe, you will damn your soul. And I believe this man is an expert enemy of the cross. I believe he snuck in sideways secretly and rose up and has brought damnable teachings into the church of Jesus Christ. He claims to be born again. He is a national leader. He is a preacher. He, he actually has a great reputation, writes Christian books. And his name is Steve Chalk, Pastor Steve Chalk. And we're going to deal with him quite a bit here tonight. But let me introduce who Steve Chalk is and was. He wrote a book in the year 2003, 20 years ago, called The Lost Message of Jesus. Isn't it amazing? They always write books about the lost message, the real Jesus, the real Paul, as if they have a special revelation. And why is it that I'm dealing with someone who wrote that 20 years ago? You know why? 20 years ago, I didn't accept him. And when he's a liberal, I don't believe he's a Christian. He's a false teacher. 20 years later, and I find in recent months, his teachings are, being, are beginning to be believed by genuine born-again Christians. That gets me very, very worried. That's why I'm dealing with it tonight. Because when these teachers come into the church and we don't realize how dangerous it is, that, that really stirs me in a real way. In his book 20 years ago called The Last Message of Jesus, talking about Jesus dying and on the cross, in our place, for our sins. Listen to what he says. The fact is that the cross isn't a form of cosmic child abuse. What I believe, and what most born-again believers believe, he called cosmic child abuse. My teaching, what I hold as the precious gospel, he called it cosmic child abuse. He goes on to say... A vengeful father punishing his son for an offense he has not even committed. Understandably, both people inside and outside of the church have found this twisted version of events morally dubious and a huge barrier to faith. Deeper than that, however, is that such a concept stands in total contradiction to the statement, God is love. If the cross is a personal act of violence, pet perpetrated by God towards humankind, but born by his son, then it makes a mockery of Jesus' own teaching to love your enemies and to refuse to repay evil with evil. Now, tonight, I'm going to go through this. I'm going to take every statement, and we're going to look at it biblically to see whether it's true or not. Is Steve Chalk right? Or is penal substitution right? It can't be both. He is an enemy of this truth. He hates this truth. And we're going to look at this very closely. 20 years ago, when he came out with this, all evangelicals across the nation of Britain arose and spoke against him. And to say, to, to say that this, what Christ done on the cross, was cosmic child abuse, what the Father done to the Son, is an abomination. This is a false teaching. But I'm worried that this begins to make inroads. Back then, 20 years ago, men like Philip Yancey come alongside him. He also had written a book called The Jesus I Never Knew. And he defended um, uh, chalk in rightness. Bran McLaren was another heretic who'd done the same. And also N.T. Wright, the Bishop of Durham at that time, who's written about 70 books. He also come alongside chalk and stood beside him, defending him. Listen to what Bishop Wright said to Chalk at that time 20 years ago. He came out publicly and he said, Chalk, I believe exactly what you've said in this book. I don't believe the teaching and penal substitution, but he says, you make a public attack against it. But I'll keep the statement, penal substitution. I'll use it, but I'll redefine it. I'll redeem it. I'll begin to use it to teach what we believe. And so you have a man like N.T. Wright also standing with him. And he's a very popular man in Britain. If you have his books, I'd suggest burn them. Let, let N.T. Wright's books be at the top of your list for burning. Do you know N.T. Wright and Steve Chalk? They're evolutionists. They don't believe in a literal Adam and Eve. They actually doubt a literal hell. 
They don't believe in a literal return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I could keep going on explaining to you what they believe. Also, chalk believes in the rights of homosexuals to be born again Christians, evangelicals, but they can live in a sexual, homosexual relationship, sexual, and yet they can be true, born again, evangelical, Bible believing Christians. And so you need to begin to understand some of the greatest minds, writers, thinkers, speakers in our nation are enemies of penal substitution. And that greatly, greatly disturbs me. These men hate this truth. And that's why we're looking at it tonight. You know, I've listened over these past three months to several, more than several, very different men in America and in Britain who hate the teaching of penal substitution. They are enemies of it. They dislike it. And I'm now just going to go through a few of their teachings and you judge for yourself. You see, they all basically say the same thing. Steve Chalk, N.T. Wright, various American preachers, everyone I've heard speak against penal substitution, that Jesus suffered the wrath of the Father on the cross. Basically, their terms, their arguments, their statements are all of the same, time and time again. But here, you've got to understand, they use straw men. They create caricatures. They take what we believe. They twist it out of shape, enlarge it, and make it something very vile and gross. They exaggerate it, but they don't present our what we believe. They also use logic, not scripture. That's why people listen to them. They sound very eloquent, educated. They have PhDs. They're very smooth in their words. It is logic. It's the logic of this world, but it's not scripture. And you're going to see that tonight. They pit scripture against logic. Also, they're confused and contradictory. It's easy to prove. They're also hypocritical in what they present. But all of them try to say that this is a new theory. Some of them say it began with, like uh, Chalk says it began with Calvin in the 16th century. Others say it was Martin Luther. And they begin to say it only began 500 years ago, this teaching, and that there's many other views, more accurate views. Some say it began with Aslam of Canterbury. Others say Alberad in the 11th century. They choose someone and say, here's a beginning point, but it didn't begin with scripture. Then they begin to say, this is only one theory of the atonement. There's at least eight views. Your view is only one. And so they begin to say, no, there are many views you've got to recognize in church history. There's many views about Jesus standing on the cross. By this time, your head is beginning to swirl. I had a friend once who was secretly a oneness Christian. He denied the Trinity. He didn't believe the Trinity was true. So do you know what he used to say to people? He says, do you know that there's 15 different views about the Godhead? Now, I never heard that before apart from him. And so he would expand it that there's many different views, not just one. And then he would begin to undermine the truth. This is what they're doing. There's eight different views. There's many different views. Your view isn't the only view. And they begin to make you question and doubt. So let me here be very pointed and clear. And I'm going to give you each of their statements and then take you to scripture. Let's test what they say. If what they say is true. Let's follow them. Let's believe them. But if they contradict the Bible, then I'm telling you tonight, they are enemies of the cross. And this is inside the church. They call themselves evangelical, born again Christians. I was asked to preach in a church in Wales once, an old retired pastor. His father had been a pastor, spirit-filled, biblical, on fire for God, a soul winner. And I went up into his study, he said, go and use my study. And I went up to his study and there sitting was about 15 books, N.T. Wright. And I said, God help me, this old retired preacher doesn't know these books is filled with air. Do you know, if you try to read his books, you don't know what he means, what he understands. Very eloquent man. You go, you go, this man's very intelligent. But if I ask you, what does he believe? You won't have a clue. Very hard to find out and understand. You've got to be very careful. Let's preach the simplicity of the gospel. Let's state a clear statements. 
If a man is vague and confused in what he believes, you ought to get very, very worried. So let me go to the first point here. Listen, all of the guys who hate penal substitution, this is one of their main statements. This was Steve Chalks, one of his main statements. Listen very carefully. God can forgive sin and sinners without the cross and without the blood being shed. Let me say that again. God can forgive sinners without the cross, without the work of the cross or the blood being shed. Then they give examples. Jesus often forgave sins before the cross in the Gospels. He forgave men. We know in the Old Testament, he forgave men. Jesus hadn't died on the cross. Do you see how they begin to talk? They want to separate forgiveness from the cross and set it as opposites, two distinct things, that you don't need the cross to be forgiven. This is where they begin to attack our teaching and the simple gospel. Some of them say about the prodigal son, look at the parable Jesus told. Where is the blood in that parable? Where is the cross? Where is substitution? Where is the punishment? There's none of it. The father forgives the son. And so they go on like this. They, they say that forgiveness is something different than paying a debt. And listen careful. This is what they say. They say, actually, for God to forgive you, it would be a contradiction to say he had to pay your debt to forgive you. And so they say this is opposite. For Jesus to pay a price on the cross for you to be forgiven. How is that forgiveness then? Surely if God forgives you, he doesn't need to pay a debt. This is how they begin to speak. They begin to attack truth. And before you know it, you start getting confused, unless you're careful to stay with the Bible. If a payment for a debt is demanded, is it really forgiveness? Do you see how dangerous, how smooth they are to separate forgiveness from the cross. Why would anyone do that? Why would they set out? In fact, what they say is the traditional views of the cross cheapens God's forgiveness because God is love. Steve Chalk says this. He emphasizes it, that forgiveness does not depend on the cross. Separate it, then you begin to destroy it. Let me answer this for you. Actually, in the book of Romans chapter 3, don't we have David being justified by faith? But Jesus hadn't died yet. The blood hadn't been shed yet. But yet here in the book of Romans, we read Abraham was justified by faith in Christ. David was justified by faith in Christ. And yet they're in the Old Testament before Jesus sheds his blood. This is the answer for you. Everyone in the Old Testament, everyone in the Gospels who Jesus dealt with, look forward in faith to the cross. All of us look back to the cross. Everyone looks to Calvary for forgiveness. Do you know all through the Old Testament, they're given prophecies and types and shadows and promises. And all of that was of the coming Lamb of God, the Messiah. Listen to what John the Baptist said in John chapter 129. He points at Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. In other words, John was saying, taking away your sin, forgiving your sin is connected to the Lamb of God. That's how it is. You cannot separate forgiveness of sin from the Lamb of God. These men come attacking our precious truth and they separate forgiveness from the blood, from the Lamb of God. You can't do that. Do you know Philip talks about the Lamb of God in Acts 8? Paul talks about the Lamb of God in 1 Corinthians 5. Peter talks about the Lamb of God in 1 Peter chapter 1. John speaks about the Lamb of God in Revelation 5. And there's many other references in our New Testament. Jesus was the Lamb of God. Without the Lamb of God, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 9, 22. It says, without the shedding of blood is no remission, no forgiveness. No release. What does the Bible say? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. What does chalk say? 
you can have forgiveness apart from the cross. It's two distinct things because forgiveness is in the heart of God. He doesn't need the cross. He doesn't need the lamb. He doesn't need the blood. This is what they're actually preaching. But they cloak their language. They come as deceivers. They are liars. They're enemies of the cross. How does Steve Chalk get around this verse in Hebrews 9.22? Listen to what he says. He says, ah, but it says in that verse in Hebrews 9, in most cases, that's the most he can argue against it. It says in most cases, he demands the shedding of blood, but not in all cases. Listen again to what it says in Hebrews 9.22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Talking about the Old Testament. Almost all things in the temple, in, in, in Israel, almost all things were purged by the blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission, no forgiveness. Let me go a bit further in Ephesians 1 verse 7. Paul writing, what did Paul think about this? In whom we have redemption. What's redemption? It's forgiveness. Purchase. A price being paid. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. Paul the Apostle in Ephesians says there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Or what about Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The New Testament teaches there is no forgiveness without the blood of the Lamb, without the shedding of the blood. You cannot separate forgiveness. You can't say God can forgive. I want to tell you God can't forgive. He won't forgive. He's never forgiven. He didn't forgive David apart from the blood of the Lamb. David looked forward in faith to Jesus Christ. We look back in faith. Nobody has ever been forgiven. Old Testament, New Testament, apart from the blood of the Lamb. These are clear biblical statements. Do you see why I get angry at these teachers who come in and cause confusion and begin to be accepted? They are false teachers. They're not friends of you or I. What about 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 5? For there is one God and one mediator between God and between men, the man Christ Jesus, listen carefully, who gave himself a ransom for all. That means a price. What is a ransom? It's a price for release, for forgiveness. So the Bible says Jesus gave himself as a price. He paid. He gave himself to pay the price. These teachers also say, oh, no, there was no price paid to the Father on the cross. Christ did not pay a price. Well, the Bible seems to say he did, who gave himself a ransom or a price for all. Listen again to Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Again, the word ransom means to pay a price. Jesus came to give himself to pay a price. There's no forgiveness apart from that price. You cannot be forgiven if he did not pay the price. What was the price? His blood. And listen, a ransom for many. The word for there is the word anti. You know the word antichrist. This is the Greek word anti. It doesn't mean to be against. It means in place of. So with antichrist, he doesn't come attacking Christ, he comes and says, I am Christ. I'm the one you should worship. So antichrist means he takes the position and the place of Christ. When it says here, when Jesus said, I came to give a ransom for many, it's a ransom in the place of many, in the room, in the position. I came to pay a price in the position of many, of you, a sinner, I took your place. Or in 1 Corinthians 15 and 3, Christ died for our sins. If you could be forgiven, why did Jesus die? If God, because he's sovereign and great and he's God, could just forgive you without the blood, without the cross, then why does our Bible say Christ died for our sins? If your sins can be forgiven apart from the cross, then why did Jesus die? God help me, I shouldn't even be having to deal with this. And yet you have to deal with this in this hour and gem generation. That's my 
first point, you can never separate. This is fundamental to their argument. I've listened to several of these guys, the main voices that deny penal substitution. They call it cosmic child abuse, and yet they separate forgiveness from the cross and the precious blood of the Lamb. You have to judge tonight, is this real evangelical Christianity or is this deception? Number two, I hope you're here for the night. I don't, I don't know how far I can get here. We, 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 we'll bear just stay here until 12 tonight and I'll only be getting going. Number two, God the Father is not an angry, wrathful deity like is presented by your version of the cross. You see, they believe what I believe and I'm preaching tonight. They say that presents God the Father as an angry, wrathful, vindictive person. Again, they're building a caricature and they keep using the word saying the Father vents his wrath against the Son who is innocent. This out of control Father just has to punish someone. He has a bloodlust. This is what they say. This is what they teach. Chalk and all of them who follow him. All of his disciples speak like this. The father, in your view, the father is venting his anger against the son. They say that's horrible. He's out of control. He's emotionally driven. Listen, it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, herein is love. He's going to tell you what real love is. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. How is love defined? He sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means a mercy seat. It was the lid of the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. Jesus came as the mercy seat. Do you know the mercy seat was the place the blood was shed? There could be no mercy. What is mercy? It is God holding back what you deserve. Grace is him giving you what you do not deserve. But mercy is him holding back what you do deserve. We deserve the wrath of God. You see, I believe that God can be angry and a loving heavenly father. There's no contradiction. They try to say you can't be loving and angry at the same time. God can't be wrathful or have wrath and yet be loving at the same time. They make these two things opposite, but the Bible doesn't. You see, my God is a loving God. God is love. But I don't believe the Bible denies the wrath of God, the anger of God, or the hatred of God. Even in the seven letters to the churches of Asia, Jesus speaking to the churches, he talks about certain things he hates in the church, certain people that he hates, certain doctrines that he hates. If you don't know how to hate, you don't know how to love. You cannot separate hatred from love. There's a combination here. And the character of God is so wonderful. He's not only love. Yes, he is love, but he's not only love. And you know what? If he didn't hate a child abuser, how could you say God is love? How could you if he didn't hate, if he wasn't angry with such wickedness and evil? How, how, how could you believe he really is love? They tried to set love in opposition to wrath. And to say that it's, it cannot be reconciled in one person or at one place. I say it is reconciled on the cross. There you see the wrath of God, the wrath of the Father, but also the love of the Father. There's no contradiction unless you try to make it that. Why are they perverting the gospel? Why are they doing that and the scriptures? The word wrath appears all through our Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, and all of the covenants. There are 20 different words used for wrath, the wrath of God, 20 different words to describe it within our Bible. In the Old Testament, the wrath of God is mentioned about 580 plus times. In the New Testament, even the Apostle John talks about the wrath of God, and yet he's the apostle of love. And wrath is also mentioned more than 10 times in the book of Romans, the wrath of God. In fact, entire chapters in Romans is given towards explaining the righteous wrath of God in the New Testament, in the age that we live. This is the real God of the Bible. Before he talks about the blood and forgiveness, he talks about the wrath of God. So his wrath 
is set in op opposition as if it contradicts, but it doesn't contradict. They see God the Father as angry, trying to take vengeance on the innocent son, as if he was vindictive or just had to punish someone. But that is not the cross at all. Listen to what it says in Acts chapter 2, 23. Him, speaking of Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him. You know what this verse says? That this was the eternal plan of God. It was in the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God before the creation of the world. God had a plan that Jesus would die on the cross in your place and in my place. God had a plan from the very beginning. And it actually says it was wicked men who took him and crucified him. But yet God's plan was there in the cross. This wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't just God the Father being angry. There was a plan for Jesus to die in your place. It says in Romans chapter 2 and 5, but after your hardness and impotent or unrepentant heart, you treasure up or store up the wrath of God against the day of wrath at the revelation of the judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. He's talking about sinners who walk in sin. God isn't loving them alone. It says you're storing up the wrath of God, people who don't repent, people who love their sin, people who hate God, who live a sinful lifestyle. What does it say? They are storing up the wrath of God. Every day they live, they're storing up the wrath of God. God doesn't want to judge them. God doesn't want any man to die and go to hell. He didn't create hell for sinners. He created for the angels, the fallen angels. It says, even in the Old Testament, he doesn't delight in the death of the unrighteous. He's not willing. He wants all men to repent and to come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet the very same God says that his long patience, his delay, the wrath of God is being stored up for a day of wrath. There is a day of wrath. Paul's writing this after the cross. Paul is writing this in the New Testament to the church that there is a day of wrath yet to come and sinners who do not repent are storing that wrath up. They are making it worse for themselves. He also says in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 10, that we wait for the, his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. If you're not saved at the cross through the blood, then you're facing the wrath to come. Only the blood of Jesus on the cross saves you from the wrath to come. The wrath of God is a real thing. And yet these teachers don't believe in the wrath of God. They don't believe that God can be angry or that at the cross, there was the wrath of God manifest against your sin on the cross. How terrible. Steve Chalk also says in one of his videos, he mentions the hymn or the song called In Christ Alone, which was written and published in 20, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure of the date of when it was published, but in 2013, he talks about the Presbyterian Church in America actually took a vote to remove In Christ Alone from their hymn book. It's no wonder they're, they're liberal, they're very worldly, they're carnal, they're not Bible-based. So they wanted to remove this song but before that, they said, can we change the line? The wrath of God was satisfied. Can we change it to the love of God was satisfied and keep it in the hymn book? They went to the authors of the song. The authors of the song wouldn't change it. So they voted to have the song taken out of their hymn book. Listen to what the song says. This gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ. I live and they wanted it out of the hymn books. Steve Chalk wanted to remove it. He is one of the big attackers against this song in Christ alone. Steve Chalk, this reprobate enemy of the cross, hates this song because of this one line and says it's despicable. This, it's grotesque. And 
God the Father, who would pour his wrath out against sin on the cross, they say, we don't even recognize this God. He's not a God of love. I'm going to tell you how dangerous this is. Number three, another thing they say, this teaching of Jesus dying in our place and suffering the wrath of God is not taught anywhere explicitly in the entire Bible, Old Testament or New Testament. I can't even believe they would say that. Can't even believe it. It's shocking. I'm talking about deception in the church and pulpits. They get right in close. 20 years ago, I thought no real born again Christian would believe this trash. Now today, I get very worried. Real Christians begin to listen to this trash. So how do we respond to this? That they say it's not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Listen, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21. For he, that is Christ. Sorry, let me say it again. For he, that is the Father, God the Father, has made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. Notice three persons are mentioned here. God the Father, God the Son, and us, sinners redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We are all mentioned in this verse. So God the Father has made Jesus to be sin. Who did it? Who made Jesus to be sin on the cross? God the Father, God in heaven, made Christ on the cross to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, these teachers often say it was the Roman soldiers that did this to Jesus. It was the Jews. It was Pilate. It was the high priest. It was imperial government. They say it was the sinners that were there at that time. They did this to Jesus. But God the Father did not do anything to Christ on the cross. That's what they say strongly. And they say nowhere in the Bible does it say that God the Father did this or caused Christ to die on the cross. I want to tell you the Bible clearly says what God the Father did to Christ on the cross. It says he the Father. This is not a work of men. Christ could not have become the Lamb of God or suffered for your sin if God the Father had not have done the work. It was the work of God the Father who made Jesus to be sin for you. This is God's work alone. No man could accomplish this. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus was made actual sin or a sinner. The hyper-faith movement in America, they make Jesus a sinner on the cross. Joyce Meyer, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, they all say, uh, if you research it, they say that Jesus' nature became sinful on the cross. Most people think the worst teaching of the prosperity gospel is their teaching on money. Oh, no, it's their teaching on the cross. Joyce Meyer actually believes that Jesus had to go down into hell. The finished work of the cross wasn't sufficient. He had to suffer in hell for three days. That's heresy. That's false teaching. You need to be very careful of false teachings about the cross. What does it mean that Jesus, that God the Father, made Jesus to be sin? Didn't mean he became a sinner. The word sin used there in the Old Testament, the word for sin and sin offering or an offering for sin are the same in the Hebrew language. In the book of Hebrews, it's the same, the word for sin and the word for sin offering. And so when it says that he, the Father, made him, Jesus, to be sin, it means a sin offering, a sacrificial lamb. God the Father made Jesus on the cross, the Lamb of God, for your sin on the cross. What does that really mean? It means the responsibility for your sin. It doesn't mean your sins were physically laid on Christ, are visibly laid on Christ. That's impossible. It means the consequence of your sin, the responsibility, the guilt, the burden, the debt was laid upon Christ. Who did that? Was it the Roman soldiers? No, it wasn't. It was God the Father 
made his only beloved son sin on the cross. These false teachers think this is a despicable teaching. But God the Father has made Christ the Son to be sin for us, for you and I, on our behalf, in our place, to benefit us. He does not just forgive us. He doesn't just ignore our sin or excuse it. Something had to happen on the cross. Jesus had to become sin. He had to become the Lamb of God. He had to suffer for your sin as the consequence of your sin in your place. Or you couldn't be forgiven. Imagine taking this doctrine out. You destroy the teaching of the cross. He takes our sin then upon him on the cross in his body, not in his spirit. You know, a lot of these teachers of who deny penal substitution that I've listened to. Do you know what they say? They say that God was killed at Calvary. God wasn't killed. Jesus was killed. Jesus died in his body, not his soul, not his spirit. His body died. It was his body that bared the consequence of your sin. It wasn't his spirit. He didn't die spiritually. God did not die at the cross. It was the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they tried to excuse sin. But I want to tell you, the blood of Jesus is the symbol of substitution. Jesus Christ took your place. Do you realize where it says here, for he hath made him to be sin for us? In the verses before this, five times the Apostle Paul writes using the word reconciliation or reconciling or reconciled. Do you know what that word reconciled means? That he uses when he's talking about Jesus, God the Father, making Jesus a sin offering in your place for your sin. What does the word reconcile mean? It means to be restored by exchanging positions, or to agree together to change your positions mutually, to entirely change your relationship in agreement, to change places. That's what substitution is. He took your place and you took his place. What is substitution? Putting one person or thing in the place of another. It's one person taking your punishment and you go free and take his righteousness. That is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, it says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 3, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, I've just given you one scripture. They say nowhere in the Bible is this taught. I've just showed you where the Father made Christ sin on the cross for you as a lamb of God, a place of suffering. But there's more than that all through the Old Testament. This truth is everywhere. I can preach it from any portion of Scripture. But Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 15 said, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. When he talks about the Scriptures there, he's talking about the Old Testament Scriptures. In other words, Jesus in the New Testament, when he came and died, he died for our sins according to the Old Testament scriptures to fulfill them. That means all through the Old Testament, we have clear teaching about Jesus dying for sins. And I believe all through the Old Testament, this truth of penal substitution is everywhere. I mean, everywhere, all through the Old Testament. If you ever hear anyone saying, that if you really understand the Hebrew teaching, the Old Testament scriptures, you would know it doesn't teach this. I, I wonder what Hebrew scriptures they're talking about, because it's everywhere. Let me give you a few examples. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Do you remember when Adam and Eve sinned? The first sin, the first fall, the first break with God. And it says there, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons to cover their midriff. Then in verse 21. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God, who did it? The Lord God, make coats of skin and clothed them. Do you realize this is the first place blood was ever shed in the entire Bible? And who sheds that blood? It is actually, it is actually the Lord God. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, it is the Lord God makes coats of skin and clothes them. It is the Lord God 
who provides coats of skins, killed the animals, and clothed Adam and Eve as the only covering for their sin. In other words, an innocent animal had to die in the place of Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness, for them to be forgiven, for them to be covered. There could be no reconciliation, no covering of their nakedness without the death of an innocent animal. This is the first dealing of sin in our entire Bible. So from the beginning of the Bible, we see there's always an innocent sacrifice, blood being shed for sinners. Adam and Eve had to have a blood sacrifice or they couldn't be forgiven. That's only one example. And I can follow this all through the Old Testament. Or you have Exodus chapter 12. You know the story well. A lamb for a household. A lamb had to be slain. And all through that chapter, only one lamb. They don't talk about many lambs. It's only one lamb. We know there had to be tens of thousands of lambs, but it always talks about the lamb. And it was a lamb for a household. Why did the lamb have to die? Why did its blood have to be shed? So that when the death angel passed over, that oldest son wouldn't die. So again, you have an innocent lamb dying in the place of those that would die, even though they were Jews, they would die if blood wasn't shed. Or what about Leviticus chapter 16? You have the scapegoat where Aaron, the high priest, would place his hands on the scapegoat. There were two goats. One of the goats, its blood was shed, and the other goat was the scapegoat taken out into the wilderness. This is symbolic of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I could continue on, but let's go further. Number four, They say the father did not punish or wound Jesus in our place on the cross. He didn't punish him for our sin in our place. It was actually the soldiers. It was Pilate. It was the religious. It was the sinners mocking him. They all sinned, but it wasn't God the father inflicting anything on Jesus on the cross. It was all human instruments. God the father didn't do anything. Let's consider this. Is that true or is it false? It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he, that is the father, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. God the father did it. Of course the soldiers did it. I don't deny that. Of course there's guilt to Pilate. I don't deny that. But also it was the work of the father. But let's go into Isaiah chapter 53, a chapter that's referenced more in the New Testament than any other Old Testament chapter. And you tell me what this says, Isaiah 53 and 5. Are they right that God the Father did not punish or wound Christ on the cross? It was only men. Listen to what it says, Isaiah 53 and 5. But he, that is Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to our own way. Listen to the next part. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is scripture. We are actually taught here Who was involved in this? What was the work of the Father at the cross? The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then it says in verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Listen to that again. It pleased the Lord, God the Father, to bruise him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who bruised the Son on the cross? I'm not making this up. These false teachers say it's nowhere in the Bible. It's not in the types. It's not in the Hebrew scripture. It's not in any of the teaching of the Apostle Paul. It's not in the book of Romans. It's not in Isaiah 53. Either they're liars or I'm a liar tonight. But what does the Bible (laughs) clearly say? Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, that is God the Father, has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. So this is talking about the actual work of the father, bruising the son on the cross, making him a sacrifice for sin. This was the work of the father. God the father wasn't angry at the son. 
but he was allowing the son because he loved the son and he loved you. He allowed the son to take that position to suffer in your place. With his stripes, we are healed. We are forgiven. We go free. We're set at liberty. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Okay, let me speed up and get quicker as our time runs out here. Number five, they say God would never punish an innocent person. Jesus was innocent. And God would never judge an innocent person, especially his son. It would not be righteous of God to punish his son, someone who is innocent. It would be wrong to punish him in your place. What saith the scripture? Let me just read the scripture and we'll move on fast. 1 Peter 3 and 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. In other words, if Jesus, the innocent, spotless Lamb of God, did not suffer for your sins, notice the words, suffered for your sins, the just for the unjust. Here's the just one suffering for your sin on the cross, that he might bring you to God. In other words, if Jesus did not suffer at the hands of the Father, you couldn't be brought to God, being put to death in the flesh. I won't say any more. Number six, it turns sinners off. This teaching of the wrath of the Father being poured out at the cross, Christ suffering in your place, it'll turn sinners off. In fact, many of them say that they have this experience that sinners have been reviled, turned away. It alienates them from the gospel. Do you know I've been on the streets of Scotland, England, Wales, London, Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland for 35 years. I've preached in Belfast and Glasgow and Edinburgh and London and Cardiff and Swansea, etc., 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 Birmingham, various other places. I have spoken to thousands upon thousands of sinners. I have heard every argument. In fact, they're just repetitions. I hear it over and over and over. I've never heard a new argument. It's actually a bit boring after a while. You, they, they think they have an argument. Do you know I've never heard one sinner approach me? And I know there are sinners who will say this. Of course there are. I've never heard one sinner in my entire life who I personally have dealt with who actually said, I cannot believe this gospel because the thought of the Father pouring out his wrath on the cross and Jesus dying to suffer for me, it's despicable. But I have heard people who deny penal substitution in the church. I've heard Steve Chalk say it. I've heard American preachers. I've heard English preachers. I've heard deniers of this truth. They say this. Listen to what the Bible says, what Jesus said in Matthew 10. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him. Jesus is talking about his loving heavenly father. Fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Do you want to tell Jesus, Jesus, your message is going to turn sinners off? Imagine saying something like this, that your heavenly father, to fear him rather than love him. I mean, whoever thought of coming to God through fear, we ought to come through love, not through fear in God. Isn't that right? So Jesus, you've got your words wrong. We in the 21st century, we could update you. We could change your gospel. We could bring you into our generation. Don't tell men that they ought to fear God the Father because he can destroy your soul in hell. Do you know why they don't preach that today? Because they don't believe in the wrath of God. They don't believe in the judgment of God. They don't believe in the righteousness of God or the holiness of God. They don't believe that God the Father poured his wrath out on Jesus so that you could go free. They don't, they don't believe this. They don't believe the gospel or the New Testament. That's why often these heretics don't believe in the authority of Scripture. They set it aside. They believe they hear God now better than any old archaic teachings in the Bible. Number seven, this teaching of yours of penal substitution 
It denies God's message of non-violence. A lot of these people are pacifists. They'll actually say um, that for the first 300 years, say things like this, that a Roman soldier wasn't allowed in the Roman army unless he renounced his sword and that the early church wouldn't be, wouldn't take up arms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What does the Bible say? Where, was the early church pacifist? Where, was Jesus? Was John the Baptist? Were the apostles? And I'm not going to argue with you. If you're a pacifist, that's fine. But what, uh, what disturbs me is these men are pacifists, and they use it to make God a pacifist. And that's very dangerous, really dangerous. The fact is, John the Baptist had soldiers come to him and said, what should we do? He's calling them to repentance. What should we do? Did he say, leave the army? No, he didn't. He said, be satisfied with your pay. That's what he actually said. Sorry, I just had something go wrong um, with it there. He said, be satisfied with your pay. Or what about the centurion who come to Jesus? Did he tell him to get out of the army? No, he didn't. Or what about Cornelius? who was a centurion. What, what about him? Was he told to leave the army? No. So it's terrible to use this sort of teaching to begin to make God the Father in heaven a pacifist. They actually say, if God ever was seen as punishing a sinner on our cross, the cross would be the supreme act of violence if God the Father was involved there. This would present God as violent and vengeful. And they say that your teaching of Jesus dying like this on the cross shows that God takes vengeance on his enemies. I want to tell you, God does take vengeance on his enemies. Steve Chalk says this message of the cross would deny that God is love. And in fact, Jesus taught, love your enemies. If he then is attacking his enemies, hating his enemies, wrathful against his enemies, or violent against his enemies, that would deny his love. Again, let me address this and tell you what the answer to this is. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. And this is what Chalk and others say. They say, look, Jesus tells you, do not take vengeance. Don't you think God is like that? That's his nature. He's telling you to not take vengeance because he will never take vengeance. He's telling you not to be violent because he'll never be violent. Listen to what it says in Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Do you know why the Lord tells you not to take vengeance? Because he is going to take vengeance. The very reason he tells you not to take vengeance into your hands, not to hate your enemies, is because he is going to take vengeance against them. He's going to punish them. He is, there's going to be a day of wrath. Or listen to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flame and fire, Listen to what Jesus is going to do with his angels when he comes again. In flame and fire, taking vengeance on them that know no, not God, and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. These people begin to move into denying there's a real, eternal, literal hell. They begin to minimize the day of wrath, that Christ, when he returns, will punish sinners and cast them into an eternal lake of fire. They begin to minimize God's wrath, his judgment. They begin to change the message of the cross. They begin to teach the Christ, the God-man, like a mere human being, as if he is to be brought down to you, unable to take vengeance against sinners. I want to tell you, my Jesus, who forgave me at Calvary, the loving Heavenly Father, who made his son a substitute, is the very same God who killed Ananas and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. 
God killed them, a husband and a son in the church for lying to the Holy Ghost. And Peter was there as a witness. The Bible says the soul that sins, it shall die. I could keep going here tonight, but I'm going to stop now. I've got numbers of their questions. They keep saying about God demanding his pound of flesh. They say that this teaching of yours divides the Trinity. It separates God the Father from the Son and makes them two people in opposition to each other. They also say your teaching is just old-fashioned paganism. That's all it is. And blah, 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 blah. I hope I've said enough. So you can begin to test things with the Bible. To go back to scripture, not to be intimidated or ashamed of the real gospel. You may ask, so what do they actually believe about the cross? Let me summarize. It's very hard to work out, very hard to find. But let me surmise, summarize simply what they believe. They believe that Calvary, the cross, was not unique. For Jesus, the cross became a way of sharing as an example and experience of all those who feel abandoned by God in their sufferings to identify with you. So he felt what you felt. It was an ex a moral example of love. He overcome evil by turning the other cheek. That's what happened there. He came to defeat the devil there, but not to suffer for your sin. Can you believe that these teachers actually deny that your sin was laid on Christ and the cross. So what do they believe? They believe Jesus, and Chalk says this, Jesus soaked up sin, the sin of the Roman soldiers, the hatred, the bitterness, the sin of those who were there 2,000 years ago. He soaked up that sin in, in himself. He was an example. He was bearing their sin, not ours, but the result of the sin around him then. He soaked up the hate, on the cross and turned it into love. That's their message of the cross. Many of them, when they're asked, how do you explain what happened to the cross? Say, I don't know. They attack what we believe. They deny the fundamentals of the gospel. And let me tell you, 20 years ago, Steve Chalk came attacking this message of the gospel. What worries me in recent months is now it begins to affect real, genuine Bible-believing Christians who love the Lord Jesus Christ, and they don't realize these arguments are from the liberal camp. It's old-fashioned modernism that Rockefeller and Carnegie poured their millions into 150 years ago to promote these teachings. It is the new world order behind this. I want to tell you, don't be in doubts. A teaching like this was financed, promoted, the social gospel to destroy the teaching of blood atonement. And men like Carnegie got their money in the Bible colleges of America. They hated the blood. They hated the gospel. And with this, I finish. This is my last finish. Paul had three finalists. And I'm going to have my last finally here and hand back to my brother. In Galatians chapter 2, we read of Peter at Antioch when Paul, the, sorry, we read of Peter going to Antioch where Paul the Apostle was, as one of the elders or leaders in that church. Peter is the famous preacher, the man who saw Pentecost, and again, revival at Cornelius's house, known all across the church. Everyone knows Peter. Peter comes down. At this point, Paul is a Bible teacher, an elder in a local church, in the church at Antioch. And we hear that Peter is glad to meet with the other believers. He sat with the young Gentile Christians who'd come out of paganism. But then when the Judaizers came from Jerusalem, these were they, those who, yes, believed in the cross and the blood and preached Jesus, but they also added other heresies in. And when they came down, Peter separated himself. It actually says he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them. And you know what Paul done? It says that Paul confronted him to his face. He was stood him to his face and said unto Peter, began preaching unto him justification by faith. And he said, Peter, you have missed the simple message of justification by faith. Can you imagine having the neck at that stage to stand up and say, Peter, 
you're compromising the simple message of the gospel. And was it saying Galatians 2, that when Peter withdrew and separated through fear, that other Jews dissembled likewise, dissembled, this spread. It means to act with hypocrisy. They begin to withdraw. It means to slowly draw back. And even Barnabas got caught up with us. Paul actually had to confront real believers, Peter, Barnabas, other real believers, who began to be affected by false teachings coming from Judaizers who were changing the simple message of the cross. And I pray, pray again that even in meeting here like this, if you've had doubts, questions arise over this beautiful teaching of penal substitution, that Jesus paid the price, the penalty, died in your place on the cross. If you have any doubts, I hope that God establishes you in the truth of God. Don't be ashamed of the simple gospel of Christ. And you need to realize, you need to contend for the simple message of the gospel. Amen. God bless you, brother. Hand back to you. That was the end of Keith's formal message, following some announcements and an introduction to the partner ministries of Graham Bridger of Illusion to Reality and Aggie and Susanna Etemayu of Issachar Ministries Outside In Team. And the rest of the meeting continued with an open discussion session with Keith responding to questions and comments. The wondrous cross On which the prince Of glory died My richest gain Say